Now we have an advance uh, in in uh, Alpha Geek Media technology today. Uh, Todd Whitehead said he did a little tweaking, and I only have to wait thirty seconds before I start the simulcast. Ooh! Because what happened, and I should to be fair to Todd, is YouTube changed a bunch of stuff that he's having to deal with. And Sergeant Muffin at DiamondClub.tv understands this very well. Uh, those guys are always trying to deal with YouTube's uh, ephemeral nature. YouTube's like a Fliberty gibbet. <laughs> also, my wife works there. Liberty gibbet. <laughs> Are you, you know, I think you should just, well, we can't see your t-shirt, but maybe you should I need just to buy make one a of those. cap. Yeah. You make a cap and then, you know, then you don't have to disclaim. Although for the audio listeners. I would just, yeah, for the audio. That's true. Mm -hmm. All right. That's been 30 seconds, right? Uh, let's say yes. Yeah. See, the, the video people get a little bonus BSing around before, <laughs> before I have to push this button. Look, nope, look, nope, more BS for you. <laughs> and in my case, that doesn't mean Bachelor of the Sign. <laughs> All right. Uh, that's running. Here we go. Oh, I better record. That would be bad. Yeah. This is the show quotidiennement de la technology. Aujourd'hui est Patrick Tuesday. Si vous voudriez soutenir DTNS, allez à patreon.com slash acedetect. I was born ready. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, September 22nd, 2015. I'm Tom Merritt. Joining me as he does Tuesdays, Mr. Patrick Beja, DTNS contributor, independent podcaster extraordinaire. Uh, Patrick, you seem to get quite a bit of enjoyment out of our uh, Patreon announcement this morning. You know, I'm I'm really getting into the the French uh, the French thing, and also every time he says I was born ready, I, I feel like yelling out, "Yeah, I was." So <laughs> yes, that's me. <laughs> that's what I was. Uh, also joining us today, Dr. Kiki, host of This Week in Science, and uh, a neuroscientist. Because S.P. Sheridan suggested a story about neuroscience. And then when I suggested it to Dr. Kiki, she's like, I was going to suggest that. So we're all like one big hive mind today, Dr. Kiki. That's right. We're bringing together the connectivity of the internet to the connectivity of the brain and the nerves. And yeah, hi. Hi, how's it going? <laughs> it's great. How are you? <laughs> it's like we're a neural network. Is that, Ooh, is now that, I'm getting scared working? a little bit. I I've get been excited. Of, I've been watching a lot of Voyager. <laughs> So I can throw terms around. I don't know what they mean. Uh, Dr. Kiki's going to explain it to us in a little bit, though. But first, let us start with the headlines. Microsoft Office 2016 for Windows launched Tuesday. Office 2016 features real-time collaboration, improved Skype integration, uh, updated apps. Uh, Office 2016 ships in 40 languages. Uh, all you got to have is Windows 7. If you're on XP, you've got other issues. Uh, Windows 7 and up, you can use Office 2016. If you're an Office 365 subscriber, just go get it. It's part of your subscription. Uh, if you want a standalone version, it costs you $149 for Windows and Mac uh, with a $229 business option that throws in Outlook. Standalone versions will still get the security updates, but they are limited to features found in the September 22nd version. That's their way of kind of nudging you toward the subscription because they roll out features to those people uh, over time. I know that some people want to have the standalone version, and I understand there are some reasons why you would want it. Sure. But really, I just uh, subscribed to Office 365, and I find it stellar. First of all, well, Office is great, and you get you know a terabyte of data on OneDrive, and it's just so it's not that expensive. I mean, I I really like it. I guess that's my endorsement. If you're the kind of person who would upgrade to Microsoft Office every time it came out, it makes perfect sense to subscribe to it. Uh, if you're the kind of person who really just needs Office software, I'd say go LibreOffice. If you're not living in the Office suite world, uh, why pay for Office at all? Just just get an open uh, open source version. That might do you just fine. Uh, so I'm, I'm kind of with you, Patrick. There are very niche reasons why you need the standalone version still, and I understand those exist. You don't have to email us and justify it. Uh, but at this point, the subscription does seem to be working. It's yeah, it for is. a lot of people. It is, it is honestly pretty good. And you know, the, it's relatively cheap if you take the family plan, which includes five, computer, all of, five computers. And I'm like curious, that, so. Dr. Kiki, what word processing do you use for documents? I use Microsoft Word, but um, that's pretty rare, actually. I tend to, hand, I tend to use uh, Google Docs. Mm -hmm. 
most yeah. often. So I, I can share yeah. them. I can, I can access them easily from any device. It just is easy for me in the cloud. I use Google Docs for almost everything. The only thing I use Office for, I use LibreOffice for several things, and I use Microsoft Office particularly for book publishing. Because even the LibreOffice templates sometimes cause funny things to happen. So, and yeah, I guess this is getting a little bit long for a headlines discussion, but um, it's it's impressive how Microsoft have managed to, has managed to keep it relevant. And honestly, I think they've written it out long enough that a few people are starting to say, "Well, I use Google Docs all the time, and it's actually my primary thing." But I'm thinking. It's getting a little bit stale at this point, and Office has been improving so much that I'm wondering if it's not, you know, some people who would never have considered switching uh, back, kind of, might consider it now. So, mm. I mean, again, Microsoft being impressive. Um, all, all that right, Office I'm talk made me thirsty for a cup of coffee, <laughs> Patrick. <laughs> well, you're in luck, because in Gadget reports, Starbucks has updated its Android app to include mobile orders and mobile payments, bringing it up to speed with the iOS version. The Android app will work in the US, Canada, and the UK in stores that the company owns. That means 7,000 Starbucks in the US, plus 2,500 Starbucks locations inside Target, and Safeway, 1,000 stores in Canada, and 700 stores in the UK. So that Starbucks at the airport's not going to take this. This is, mm -hmm. this is what that means. And the never Starbucks going. in France aren't going to take them either. No. Yeah, you're left out this time. Yeah. I don't um, go to Starbucks anyway. <clears throat> I don't go to Starbucks either. There is one near my house. I go um, to Starbucks if I have a gift card. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of what happens. Eileen gets gift cards from people, and yeah. then we go to Starbucks to spend her gift card. That's yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, Xiaomi has released the Mi 4C flagship smartphone in China. Uh, the Mi 4C has a six-core, 64-bit Snapdragon 808 processor, 5-inch 1080p screen, dual 4G SIM support, USB-C. It's all running on the MIUI 6 OS. And you'll be able to upgrade to MIUI 7 once that comes out soon. The Mi 4C goes on sale in China Wednesday. Uh, the 2 gigabytes of RAM, 16 gigabyte version for 1299 RMB. 1299 uh, RMB. That's about $204 US. Then there's a 3 gigabyte RAM, 32 gigabyte storage version for 1499 RMB. So that's about 235 US. Xiaomi has also launched Mi Mobile a new carrier service. It's an MVNO now uh, that offers on-demand roaming for prepaid and pay-as-you-go plans. So finally, uh, all those people accuse Xiaomi of always imitating Apple. They're only imitating an Apple rumor here. Apple hasn't launched an MVNO. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, you know, trying to be uh, proactive in their imitation. Um, you know, I've, I've been thinking maybe I should get a Xiaomi uh, phone, if only just to test, um, to have a little bit more on-hands experience with Android. And uh, my friends have been talking about AliExpress. I don't know if you if you use it or if you have it in the U.S., but it's relatively easy to find uh, those cheap, phone, cheap phones over there. Uh, although I can't find, for some reason, the search part doesn't return phones to me, only hmm. cases and such. So if anyone in the chat room has a link to the latest Xiaomi for cheap at, on AliExpress... You have to you usually know, go gray market in the Europe and US if you want to get a Mi phone because yeah. they don't officially sell them I guess. Uh, there. But, but, but yeah, it's, it's so cheap. I'm thinking, you know... It's not Android, person. though. It's, it's MIUI. Oh, is it? Oh, okay. So oh, it's, an, it's Android underneath, but it's like Amazon with the fire right. tablets, right? Uh, yeah, no, if you want to you go pure Google. So, oh, I, I, I'm an idiot. All right, never mind. <laughs> Moving on. Uh, Francis Constitutional Court rejected Uber's appeal Tuesday, upholding a ban on Uber Pop. The law only allows taxi services and certified chauffeurs to operate systems that put clients in touch with drivers. The decision does not affect Uber's other services, which employ professional drivers. Next week, two Uber France executives are due to stand trial for deceptive business practices. Um, mm. So you remember early in the summer when the taxis were really angry and burning cars in Paris, uh, burning Uber cars? Well, the taxi drivers. Uh, 
Yes. The taxis themselves weren't burning anything. <laughs> oh. Well, I, you know, uh, from what they were saying, the taxis might have been angry. Okay, oh, I wasn't there. You're closer to it. So. Um, but so basically, it, it really annoyed me for a bunch of reasons at that point. One of the reasons was that the uh, legal proceedings were underway, and in all likeliness, uh, the Constitutional Court was going to reject uh, that appeal by Uber, which the taxis were pro- the taxi drivers were protesting. Um, so this is just a continuation, and which proves it was going to happen anyway. So, well, and it, it's it's an interesting argument. I mean, this is one of the few times Uber has legitimately been just defending their ride sharing. We always talk about Uber as being ride sharing. Most of what people use is Uber X or Uber Black. Uh, which isn't ride sharing. That's just a nifty way of putting professional drivers in touch with you. And it still is efficient and saves money. And that's where Uber gets in the most trouble because they're not always using, they're following the rules of a taxi system, even though they're running a professional driver system. This one is interesting to me because France says, we don't care if it's ride sharing. We don't care if it's independent people using Uber to get in touch with independent drivers. You can't do it. You can't, you can't operate a system that puts people in touch with each other if it has to do with driving. So the thing is, the, the issue is, um, obviously the issue is Uber, but especially there are still debates about the Uber regular service, but for Uber Pop, uh, it is very clearly regular people who are acting as taxis, and Uber is saying, they're not taxis, they're ride-sharing, as, as you were pointing out, mm-hmm. which is absolutely untrue in this case, right? They are actually uh, using this service to provide taxi services. So there was very little doubt that this was going to get uh, banned. And uh, for, for, uh, for the other services, UberX and Uber Regular, they are professional drivers and they're, they're, um, uh, there are issues about them being hailed in the streets and things like that. Uh, but th- this is still under discussion. For Uber Pop, everyone knew it's not, you know, it's, it, they're full of uh, poo. Do you still use them? <laughs> I use Uber, of course. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I think they were right to, uh, uh, to question the validity of Uber Pop. Mm-hmm. I think under the, the, the rules and the laws, even if, if they are relatively new, Uber Pop is probably shouldn't be allowed to operate. Now, whether or not you agree with the laws is a different matter. But, but now um, nobody can do that, even if they're not trying to hoodwink the law. Like somebody who legitimately wants to put together a ride-sharing service can't. Well, actually, um, there's a company called uh, Blablacar, which is a French company that just um, got a pretty uh, impressive fundraising round um, that does that, but for long distance. So it Mm -hmm. is actual ride sharing uh, from city to city or, you know, these kinds of things. It's just that you can't use the service to drive around, wait for someone to call you, go there and do that all day. Right. Right. So... It's a little different. Uh, Google, Microsoft, Qualcomm, and Baidu, uh, the search engine company out of China, all participated in the latest round of funding for Cloudflare, the cloud security company that's most famous for combating denial of service attacks, although they do much more than just that. Forbes points out the announcement comes a little bit more than a week after Cloudflare announced a partnership with Baidu to offer Cloudflare services in China. Cloudflare CEO Matthew Prince compares Amazon's all-in-one cloud services to Apple and says of his own company, Cloudflare, Flare, we're the Android of cloud services because we're open to other people. We can get Google and Baidu. I mean, Google and Baidu don't invest in a lot of things at the same time. In fact, Uber is one of the few that they both do uh, because they're competitors. But Cloudflare's like, hey, we're just the endpoint security. That's all we want to do. I remember when Cloudflare was just launching and it was making all of this noise because they would protect you against uh, uh, DDoSs and now they've grown so fast. Ah, they grow up so fast. <laughs> TechCrunch reports on the next version of Formlabs 3D printer, the appropriately named Form 2. Formlabs printers uh, use resin hardened by lasers. Printed objects must be cured in rubbing alcohol. The Form 2 has a 25 200 micron. Is that 25 to 200 or is yeah. it a unit mm-hmm. of right? So 25 to 200 micron layer height and a new system that allows you to swap out official resins with your own brew. 
The system also has a wiper arm to prepare each layer as it is printed, removing fragments. The Form 2 is available for order now for $3,499 plus $149 per liter of resin. So this is one um, that's really cool. It's a lot of people are calling it like the Macintosh of printers because it's so nicely designed and really simple to use, except for that curing and rubbing alcohol bath part, right? <laughs> like it's really cool. It uses lasers to harden the resin. So that and it, and it like basically prints up. It sticks to the top and the and the platform raises up as it prints and the parts that are hardened just stay and the rest falls back down into the resin bath. But then when it's done, you have to bathe it in isopropyl uh, to cure it. So it's really best for somebody who has a sink, like a lab. Uh, Kiki, have you used this ever or anything like it? I haven't used this particular printer, no. But um, it's, it's, I mean, the, the additional step of the alcohol bath is not really a big deal. I mean, you just... You just have the alcohol bath, and you can you can you don't need a sink for that necessarily. You can you can have a little plastic tub or a you know a, some kind of plastic polymer tub that you put the alcohol in. You're or not going to put it in. Glass in, is fantastic. The elementary school is not going to have one, but you're saying you could do this on your kitchen. You could totally do this in your kitchen, and and uh, isopropyl alcohol. I mean, aside from being flammable, is not really <laughs> it's not a terrible thing to have around. So I mean, I. Maybe not in elementary school, but um, in a high school. But high sure. school, sure, yeah. 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 But maybe not consumer grade. I mean, it, it's it's interesting because you're saying, "Hey, it's cool. <laughs> you know, it's not a big deal." And I'm thinking, "Yeah, it's not." But I'm not sure the regular people want to bother with all of this, right? Well, well I, I mean, to get the the uh, 25 microns is really small, and so if you're getting some really great resolution in the printing, and you're able to produce things that you wouldn't be able to produce with other printers. Yeah. You want to do you would go through that extra step. I think the frustrating part about it is, is Formlabs has made this printer so simple on the yeah. printing part yeah. that it's just frustrating to like and I still have to do one more thing that's not the printer doesn't do for me because if they could do the the curing process also, automatically, yeah. this thing would be killer. I mean, I, yeah. I, I think that's the only the only downgrade to it, which is why it gets more attention. Yeah. India has amended its controversial national encryption policy to exempt mass encryption products. The first draft of this law had required users, you as a phone user, to store any encrypted communication on your phone in plain text for 90 days. Uh, and then the government could say, we need to look at that within that 90 days. Uh, a lot of people protested that, funny. Um, that would have included apps like WhatsApp, Viber, Hike. Um, the draft now has been amended. It still requires software makers to register with the government if their product uses any kind of encryption. So expect some more changes. The Department of Electronics and Information Technology has opened the draft up for public comment in India until October 16th. I'm wondering how much of all of this, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more in the uh, with the messages that we've we've received. Um, is it really just governments not understanding technology at all? This and in some cases, like you know, yeah. you explain it to them, they get it. In some cases, they don't. But I really hope that this just goes away when the you know previous generation <laughs> goes away too. Yeah. Um, uh, this is really misreading the public. Like, yeah. no, you can't just make everybody store stuff so that you can hopefully go get it from people later. Like, that's just not, that doesn't make any sense. Do these people I mean, not a, use phones? Yeah, but it's a completely different uh, governmental system. You know, I mean, they have, uh, they have different priorities and it's, um, you know, they have a right to have their own, uh, their own ideas about how data should be accessed, accessed by the government. We have our idea here and we have a certain perspective on it. We don't think what they're doing in India is necessarily um, thoughtful or insightful, um, but they are being thoughtful and insightful from their own perspective. So we just have to you know, accept that and go through the process. Mm -hmm. It seems like the people of India sort of don't think it's very thoughtful or <laughs> well, insightful. Uh, well, sure. The pe yeah, the, the people who are involved, I mean, people want to have their own data security. They want to have, uh, not have to have the government access their stuff or have, you know, they want privacy of a certain, of a certain extent. And, but the government's like, we want into your, you know, into your life if we want it. <laughs> yeah. you know? And, 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 and you know, I think 
I will give the Indian government credit for backtracking, for amending, mm -hmm. responding to popular opinion, and yeah. opening the draft for more comments. That's the right thing. Which is do. great. Mm. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I, I would agree with you, like, most of the time, but also sometimes it's just some people do silly stuff. It's sometimes. true. It's true. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Oyster, the Netflix of books, announced Monday it is shutting down. Aw. Recode reports most of its team is moving to Google, and Google will compensate Oyster investors for the hires. Google is carefully not saying they're buying Oyster. Yeah, so this is Google trying to avoid some kind of regulatory uh, investigation is my guess, especially since they're still fighting the Authors Guild over Google Books, because these folks are going to go work on Google Books. Yeah. And uh, they don't need to have regulatory investigation of them purchasing a company. So they, the, the next best thing, hire all the best people away uh, and then compensate the investors so that they don't get in trouble from them. Yanev05 sent us a tale of two echoes over at ZDNet. Author David Gewertz uh, wrote about the night of evil Alexa. The Amazon Web Services outage this weekend led one of his bedroom echoes to go rogue. The unit not only refused to turn on the lights, but any request resulted in red spinning lights while Alexa herself spoke slow, meaningless words. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow, Gertz was able to go to sleep after that. Uh, and the next morning, his alarm rang as normal from the Echo. However, he could not get it to turn off. So he finally gave up and unplugged the device uh, and then wrote an article pondering the future of the Internet of Things. And you know, the real, the real lesson and the real question here that we all should, should ponder is what happens the day you can't plug the device off. No, oh, wireless oh. power. No! <laughs> <laughs> All right, Captain Trud pointed out that Nvidia has partnered with has partnered with several manufacturers to pull to put a special oh, wow, a specially binned version of its GTX 980 desktop graphics card into laptops. Hmm. Asus and MSI are among the companies who will sell the 17-inch 1080p display behemoth that uh, with that card that has 248 2048 2048 sorry uh, CUDA cores up to 8 gigabytes of 7 gigahertz GD, uh, GDDR5 memory and an 1126 megahertz core clock users will be able to tweak the fan curve of the GPU as well as adjust the core clock and memory speeds. NVIDIA's senior product manager for GeForce Notebooks, Brian Choi, told Ars Technica, we're not going for the mainstream guy who's looking for something slim and light. No kidding. No kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to pick up a couple of these, just throw them a bag. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. I mean, this is, this is basically NVIDIA saying we have gotten to the point where we can technically say we can put a desktop GPU in a laptop. It may well, have a lot like, of caveats on that, but nobody did it before. Your laptop will be as big as a desktop. But. It might be close to that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of, it's, I mean, GTX 980 is one of the most powerful, power, you know, it's, yeah. it's the standard line, the most powerful one. It's kind of... I can't imagine who would actually want to have... It's going to be literally as heavy as a, as a desktop. But it will have a screen. It will be transportable. I guess we've had that for a long time. And hopefully some of these companies come up with ones with 4K screens. Uh, because 1080p with the GTX 980 mm -hmm. does seem like a little bit of a waste. Well, you get better FPS. Yeah, you get lots of other things. That's true. That's a good point. Um, that, my friends, is a look at the headlines. Didn't like those headlines? Well, did you vote? at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com because that's where we got Captain Chud's recommendation and maybe we can get yours too. More people that vote, better it helps us, but it always helps us, dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. All right, let's talk about the team of researchers from several universities, University of Minnesota, Virginia Tech, Maryland, Princeton, Johns Hopkins, getting together to create a 3D printed guide for a rat's sciatic nerve on a custom built machine. Dr. Kiki, what did they do again? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the 
the brief brief summary um, is that like what you said they they show that they can take a complex nerve structure not just a straight line of a nerve but something that splits into a bifurcation um, and scan it and then 3D print it and then take that scaffold that they printed, stick it in a mouse and stick the ends of nerves into the end of the scaffold and the nerves would grow together. And they did. So they had nerve regrowth and they gained functional re, uh, reuse, reanimation of the limb. So the 3D printing part I get, which is yeah. printing the scaffold up out of silicone, uh, but they had to do something else to it uh, and and I'm, I'm curious why you would need to print the scaffolding. Is that the only way to, to regrow the nerve properly? Yeah, well, so part of the scaffolding is that they also embedded it with nerve growth factors. And there are specific chemical signals within the body that different kinds of nerves respond to. And so if you can take a motor nerve that sends motor signals to your limbs, and if that's been cut and you can put motor uh, motor, motor growth factor in a little tube and stick the ends of a broken motor nerve in there, then that chemical signal will say, grow this way. And it basically tells the nerve to build new parts of itself and extend to the other end where it'll reconnect. Same thing for the sensory nerves. And so the scaffold had these different instructions in it for mo the motor nerve that had been cut and also for sensory nerve part of the sciatic nerve that had been cut. And so they grew in the opposite directions. So I understand the, the motor goo and the <laughs> sensory the mo goo. <laughs> the different, this goo and that goo, yeah. yeah. So the, you, you put the two goos in the right place and the, basically what the scaffold is basically a, a Y-shaped tube, right? It's, it's, yes. a, it's, it's a tiny tube. A tiny tube. Um, what I don't understand in all of those stories really is, well, mm -hmm. I, I do understand it, but why does 3D printing make this possible? Because it seems like this wasn't possible at all before. Can't, don't labs have like incredible machines that can, it's just a piece of plastic. Why can't we build this tiny piece of plastic for this use without a 3D printer? Why does it make it so much, why does it advance things so much faster? Okay, so the complexity of what you look at when you see a nerve, you look in, in, a, in an image from an anatomy textbook, what you see is, an, is this big white structure, right? It's just this white tube looking structure. But inside of that are sometimes hundreds of other of nerve fibers. And so there are all these nerve fibers that have to connect inside from one broken end to the other broken end. And so the 3D printing that, uh, technique that they used enables the researchers to actually design guide channels. So there are these little microscopic channels inside of the scaffold that actually allow the fibers to grow and physically tell it, you should go that way. It's kind of like a riverbed for a river. It funnels the water in a particular direction. So the physical structure of the 3D printing is fine enough um, with the, the technique that they're using that they could actually get these channels to help guide. And then that along with the chemical signals, it accentuated the growth of the nerve and the uh, reconnecting and the regain of function. So if Which, I understand this right, they, you know, uh, Grandpa Jean rat is complaining about his sciatica uh, <laughs> and they go scan healthy uh, 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 Cousin Joe rat's sciatic nerve and they can use that scan then to print the one for Grandpa Jean? Well, so that's the question. Um, the, yes, anat anatomically, most nerves are going pretty much in the same direction and have a fairly similar structure. So ideally, you would want a healthy scan from the same individual. You know, if you could get scan your own nerves or grandpa's nerves before sciatica set in, then it would be great to use his own nerve scans. Um, what so what you're saying is we should go, we should go right now get... <laughs> Yeah. 100% of everything of us, just in case. Just in case, yeah. The, what the researchers are hoping to do is um, get create a library of scans from lots of individuals so that um, nerves that have been damaged, we can kind of get a best fit for the person that you would be creating a new nerve a new so you get nerve a catalog. segment for. Yeah, you get a catalog, a nerve catalog. <laughs> so you're like, oh, this one looks, does this one make me look fat? No, does you're this good. one come in rose gold <laughs> for my myelin sheath? Yeah. 
I think, uh, you know, part of what they did here is um, usually they've, there have been previous uh, and different 3D printing techniques that involve printing resin structures with laser or, um, and in this technique they used silicone, um, so it's inert in the body, it's not going to cause any rejection issues. Additionally, um, they're looking into other types of scaffolding material that would be potentially reabsorbed by the body. You remember mm -hmm. the, the 3D printed, I think it was the 3D printed trachea mm -hmm. for the young child um, last year. Um, that the, the material they used for that actually gets reabsorbed by the body over the course of three or four years. So, so they had to go back in and take it out, right? Yeah. yeah so that, that was going to be my question, actually. Do they, they do have to do that. They have to go in and cut it off and take it out. Well, with this, uh, with this one. For, not necessarily. So it's made out of silicone, so it's com it's completely inert. So it's not um, going to do any. It's not going to cause any problems, and it potentially holds the nerve fibers in place. It wouldn't have to be removed, hmm. um, but it would be better to have the nerves completely on their own and not be encased by anything. So a bioabsorbable material is the ideal, but whether or not it will work really well in people is the question. And that's what we still haven't done. This is a mouse study. So once again, we've helped mice, but we have not well, yet done I'm anything telling you, for those, people. Those mice, they're getting all the perks. Yeah. Yeah. Unacceptable. They get all the best stuff. Bionic um, mice. I don't that's know right. if I'd trade myself for a mouse or a rat, though, to be honest. Uh, well, it may be not a lab. Rad. They yeah. they seem to have a, a difficult life, but just so th these things always seem like they're. I mean, to us mere, you know, non scientists, they're like, oh yeah, this 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 sounds cool. It sounds incredible. But how much of an advance is it actually? Is it like this revolutionary thing that is going to be used probably in five years everywhere? And like, how big a deal is it? Well, uh, hopefully it, it, it is a big deal because um, it seems as though it is a fairly simple technique. What they talk about is this one-pot 3D printing. So they're not using uh, multiple devices to uh, create this three-dimensional structure. They've got a 3D printer that prints the silicone and dopes it with the chemical signals and gets everything right in one go. Um, and that is going to be, that, that's amazing. And then if you also have the scans available um, or have, have an in-house scanning possibility, you could scan, um, do a single surgery, scan and print, do a single surgery, and uh, a patient could potentially be in and out of the hospital in less time than currently. Takes. So you could scan them and print them in, during one surgical procedure? Potentially. Whoa. That's, yeah. It's got to be a faster printer, I guess. But It would have to be a faster printer, <laughs> but it's, uh, it is a fair, I mean, it's, it's, th the speed is getting faster and yeah. faster. And um, uh, the, the, the benefit here is that if you're getting a nerve graft uh, for for nerve damage, they have to take a nerve out of another part of your body. Doing that causes, a, you know, nerve death in that area. You're basically going to end up losing some amount of feeling. And it's two surgeries because you have to have one surgery to remove a nerve. You have to have a second surgery to implant the nerve in the place where you want it to go. And then you don't even know whether or not it's going to take. And mm. so there is there is a high probability of rejection and infection um, with the current techniques that are used. And so these 3D printing technologies, because you can dope with the chemicals that, that basically are like, come on, nerve, grow, you can do it. Those little cheerleaders. And, yeah, Motor, and, nerve, motor, and, nerve. Exactly. And speed up how fast the growth happens. So in these mice, it was a three-month process to regrow 10 millimeters of, um, of an excised nerve. And that's a lot. Most of the, uh, most of the single nerve uh, trans, uh, not transplants, but um, uh, scaffold experiments that have been done. And we're looking at like three or four millimeters. And so 10 millimeters in three months, you might think, oh, that's not very far, but nerves grow incredibly slowly. And so this happened fast and it pretty much worked. So this is a big step forward. So is does that mean that, you know, when we're like we see in movies or TV shows like accidents and they're like, oh, I can't feel my legs. And you're like, oh, is, is it my like my my uh, spinal cord is broken? Like, can we now think 
this is probably going to be fixable. So you'll be, oh, I can't feel my yeah, leg. Yeah, just take them into the, the office depot and scan and yeah. print a new one. <laughs> but, scan and well, print a new spinal cord. Yeah, no. It's kind of half of a serious question, though. Mm -hmm. uh, does it mean that when you, you actually lose... Uh, motor function in your limb, you can hope that at some point in the near future you'll be able to regain that kind of function? Or um, So spinal cord itself is a little bit different uh, than the peripheral nerves. And so what we're talking about with the sciatic nerve and other nerves like that is these are peripheral nerves. Um, and so those say not you know, not a car accident where you break your spine and sever the, the spinal cord, but say you have... Um, another accident where uh, you cut nerves in your arm or in your leg, um, you, the possibility of having those reattached or segments that are missing or crushed be regrown is going to be much higher. And, and you kind of touched on this, but different kinds of 3D printers can do this. They customized a 3D printer for this particular experiment, yes. but I assume that's because they wanted to make sure it was printing the growth factors correctly. Yes. But it was, it was still a normal 3D printer. They didn't have to build it from scratch, right? They did not build it from scratch, no, but I, um, it's, a, it's a custom 3D printer that they used. Customized, yeah. customized and modified. <laughs> yeah, for, for nerve printing. Fascinating yeah. stuff. Uh, yeah. Thank you for, for talking with us about this, Kiki. This is, this is really cool. Even if we're a ways off from printing spinal cords, like peripheral nerves is a huge thing for, for people. Um, oh, it's, it, it's, this is really big. Um, you know, this kind of stuff where it's, oh, we can print an ear, we can do that. I mean, some of this stuff is gimmicky. You know, mm -hmm. just to show that we can do it. Um, but this, it is, even though it doesn't seem like a huge, it's not a, you know, giant step forward, but it is a step in the right direction. And um, it's, I think it's really good news. Uh, you know, I don't know about five years, but they have to test it in humans and see if it works and get, you know, all the FDA approval and all that yeah, kind yeah. of stuff before it can be used medically. But um, it is, it is a very promising technique. Well, you're saying that the nerve thing is like a bigger deal uh, because you're a neuroscientist. I bet the ear scientists are all excited about the ear growing. <laughs> ear scientists. Even those throat doctors say a different tune. That's right. Uh, no, I do think that the peripheral nerve regrowth probably, it seems to me, it just seems more applicable than, you know, how many people do you know need a new ear? Yeah. I don't know. Maybe a painter. Like fixing my hearing, totally necessary. But yeah, how many Van Goghs out there? It's, I don't know. It's a proof of concept, though. It's, it's, all, yeah. it's all interesting. And, and I'm sure those who actually do need them will be very happy that they exist. But yeah, they'll also be writing it to me now. Common. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're all going to say, but I need this. Talk. I need it. I'm the guy who needs an ear. Thanks a lot, Marin. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Our pick of the. Done. <laughs> yeah, our pick of the day comes from Andrew and finally raining Portland, Oregon. Can you confirm that, Kiki? It's sunny right now. <laughs> not right now. It's not, not, he wrote this a while ago. Uh, he wanted to suggest reddit.tv, a playlist of videos from r slash videos that by default uh, plays videos from that subreddit, but can be set to any subreddit, and you get an ever-updating playlist of the best videos in that subreddit, or basically all the videos in that subreddit. So you can just, if you don't know what to watch on the internet, you can just go to reddit.tv and just watch all day long. And then if you go to reddit.tv slash r slash, don't go to Daily Tech News Show because we don't have any videos listed right now. But if we did, you could set it to that and, and it would play whatever videos are in that subreddit. It's pretty nifty. Thanks, Andrew. Send your picks to feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com and you can find my picks at dailytechnewsshow.com slash picks. A uh, few messages of the day. Uh, we talked about the Keneal Judgment, CNIL, uh, uh, and we got an email who said, neither the Keneal Judgment nor the original right to be forgotten ruling are attacks on the U.S. First Amendment and free expression. The last paragraph of the press release reads, contrary to what Google has stated, this decision does not show any willingness on the part of the Keneal to apply French law extraterritorially. It simply requests full observance of European legislation by non-European players offering their services in Europe. In other words, the Keneal is asking Google to ensure that the RTBF is made effective within the European Union. Uh, and our, our writer says this is geo-blocking by any other name and completely familiar to Google. For example, if YouTube has agreed to block access in Europe to some Hollywood content they have a deal for in the US, the no effort by me to switch to the U.S. YouTube site will magically give me access. Uh, unless you use a VPN and you look right. like you're coming from the U.S., right? <laughs> uh, so this is, this is him saying, look, 
France is just saying you shouldn't have any of your search engines that are a, a, a visible to Europeans show those right to be forgotten links. We're not trying to say that you have to export this. You could show Google.fr with these links to people in the US, just don't show them to people in the EU. So yeah, that's not, ex they're not exactly saying just geoblock engine will be fine. They are saying very explicitly, uh, we're not, we don't think that any one country should control what people in another country should see, but they're also saying at the same time, uh, you know, we are just trying to make Google apply the law of this one country where, where they're operating for everyone in this country, which implies for all that it should apply to all of the domains. Uh, and, and they're not explaining how they want this to apply. So it, it, they're not saying just geoblock it, and they're not saying just change it for every uh, domain, including, you know, dot .com, dot .whatever. Um, but I'm not sure... Maybe geoblocking is going to satisfy them. They're just not saying that. And they, they could have said just geoblocking will be good. So it's not as clear as uh, Ryder is, is uh, making it out to be. I would be a little bit more cautious in the interpretation. I, yeah, I would say it does feel a little bit like they're saying, uh, no, you don't get to leave these links up in other sites, but it's not our problem what other... Uh, issues that cause we're going to say we don't need it to be you know enforced outside of EU borders but we're not going to get we're not we're also not going to propose a, a, a solution um, yeah so yeah I mean I wonder what would happen if Google came back and said all right fine this, this then we'll geoblock and you'll only get google.fr when you're in France I, I, I mentioned that yesterday I wonder what the response would be to that yeah, I think, you know, I understand the reasoning. I think it's it's still taking a, a, a you know, a, a fighter jet to a hammer problem. Um, mm -hmm. there, there's no easy way of fixing it. But again, the there are so many issues in that RTBF <laughs> uh, problem that we could make a whole show about it. But yeah, anyway, it's not very clear. They're not being clear. And in legal terms, the lack of clarity is always an issue, so... Uh, and Burke, who wrote us from Turkey yesterday, uh, wrote back once his bus was done uh, getting him to where he was going uh, with a little bit more, wanting to say that uh, Turkey uh, installment plans for phones were at one point so widespread that it caused a credit bubble. And therefore, for the past couple of years, installment plans for smartphones have been against the law. Uh, it's the reverse of the U.S. where we're just now starting to get installment plans. Uh, why does Burke bring this up? He says, at one point, consumerism made purchasing things extremely easy. And because of Turk's social competitiveness, most people's priority purchase quickly became smartphones where they could IM and follow each other. Combine this with the Streisand effect and the power of word of mouth, it seems no longer to be that difficult to see why social apps are as popular as they are in Turkey. I'm not too sure about the smartphone trends in other countries, but in Turkey, with a population of 70 plus million and an abundance of smartphones, it's only natural to see some periscopes sprouting up from the fertile soils of this land. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's uh, another insight uh, into why the social networking, particularly Periscope, like we were talking about yesterday, is so popular in Turkey. I had no idea that the installment plans caused a credit bubble in Turkey, that's fascinating. This this is why I love this show. You get people from the actual places to tell you what it actually is. Uh, you uh, nothing to do with any of this, but you usually don't get this in in traditional media, and certainly not about tech, right? You, you don't yeah. hear from the people on the ground. So, well, thank you so much, thank Burke, you, Burke. for yeah, for being willing to. Uh, to write in about that. And and not even just geographically, but subject matter wise. Thank you so much, Dr. Kiki. For, You're welcome. For coming on and talking neuroscience and 3D printers. That was awesome. Oh, so much fun. It's such a great topic. I love Folks, it. Folks, if you guys liked that and you want more, there's been that kind of talk going on every week for decades. I think we can literally say decades, right? At least more than one decade, yeah. I mean, yeah, so it's plural, <laughs> technically plural. plural. This week let's, in science. Let's round it up. Yeah, go check it out. This Week in Science, the original uh, pre-podcast show that okay. Kiki has been doing for a long time. And it's a fantastic show. I am, I am Kiki's boss. I am a patron. You uh, are. It's true. So, We're so supported go, on Patreon. 
Go right. check it out. Uh, uh, back her on Patreon. Listen to This Week in Science. Uh, and follow Kiki on Twitter, twitter.com slash drkiki, D-R-K-I-K-I. Uh, any, any news from This Week in Science? Anything to tell folks about particularly? Uh, this week, I think we're going to be talking a little bit more about neuroscience because it's a topic that I love, but there's some really interesting question about how we remember and whether or not there are drugs, uh, like amnesic drugs, that really can help us with things like PTSD or whether it's just, uh, just something that we don't really understand about the brain yet. Got it. Fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, so, some cool stuff. TWIS.org, folks. Twiz. Oh, yeah, and humming giraffes. Humming? Okay, now you sold me. <laughs> uh, and, of course, you can follow Patrick on Twitter, twitter.com slash notpatrick, N-O-T-P-A-T-R-I-C-K, uh, and frenchspin.com. If you like the world perspective on things, you got to subscribe to the Phileas Club. It's a monthly meeting of the minds of the world. Yeah, yeah, it is. And hopefully you will like it. You might also like if you enjoy uh, gaming in any way. We have a semi-serious show about gaming called Pixels. And the latest episode is called Unlimited Power. Uh, in that show, uh, we talk about the Tokyo Game Show, which is kind of the serious news of gaming. But we also let go and I discuss my love for Destiny and its latest expansion. So if you want to understand why Destiny is absolutely awesome as a game, and you should, it's, it's really fun. Uh, just go listen to Unlimited Power, Pixels number 21, and you'll find out why it's exciting. Not every network, not every advertiser would support the kind of content that I want to do, the kind of content that we do on this show, but you do. Uh, and we thank you for that. You make this show possible. If you get some value out of the show, please consider giving some value back. DailyTechNewsShow.com slash support to find out more. Our email address is feedback at DailyTechNewsShow.com. You can call us 512-59-DAILY. That's 512-593-2459. Listen to the show live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time at AlphaGeekRadio.com. Visit our website, DailyTechNewsShow.com. Back tomorrow with Scott Johnson. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> that was an awesome show. Thank you so much, Dr. Yay. Kiki. You're welcome. Thanks, Kiki. Take the science and the tech and you put it together. and It's delicious. It's a podcast. That's right. Woo. Woo-hoo, woo-hoo. That was fun. Yeah, it was good stuff. Good stuff. And it was a uh, it was a nice change of pace. I think, in a way, to have kind of an in depth medical. Yeah, we got into biotech in yeah. a perfectly natural way. Yep. Which is awesome. As much as I like iPhones and stuff from Apple. <laughs> well, you know, Apple's getting into the nerve business now. I hear there's a rumor. Uh, people familiar <laughs> with the matter, the eye nerves. Um, in rose it's gonna gold, really get under your skin, space Tom. black. <laughs> <laughs> You're not the only one that can pun or ish okay. or say silly things. <laughs> uh, punishing, <laughs> punishing, punishing. That should be a show. Is that not a show? <laughs> it should be right. Where people get people like you know, it's a game show, and if you lose, you get punned at. <laughs> No, you have to come with good puns. If you don't, you get punched in the face. Ouch. (laughs) Pun or punch? You've been punched. (laughs) Curtis B says the show was nerve wracking. Uh, 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 Good. Where? Hi, Ellie. Oh, and Kiki, as, as you may or may not recall, I just uh, leave the stream running while I edit. So if you need to go, go whenever you want. Ow. 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 At some point, at some point <laughs> lunch will have to happen. I do mm. need a, uh, a title, though. Ooh, oh, titles. Showbot.tv. Show. We've got Show Me What You Got. <laughs> Poober. <laughs> Pumpkin Spice Tech News. <laughs> Aside from being flammable. Will make you nervous. Of bionic mice and men. Ooh, that one's good. 
I like uh, lab mice get all the perks, but it's not getting lost. <laughs> lab mice <laughs> get all the perks. I can't feel my face when you cut my nerves. <laughs> I can't feel my face because you severed my peripheral nerves. <laughs> and my face is numb because of that. I'm not, this is not a song. Please help me. <laughs> no one can help, Tom. There's no help. <laughs> Ooh, Verizon tells me I get four hundred dollars towards a new phone. What? And what? Ooh, save four hundred dollars. Oh, but I have to buy a phone. What? Uh, just give me the four hundred dollars. I, <laughs> I don't want the phone. I just want your four hundred dollars. <clears throat> Can I just have the money? <laughs> no. I broke down and, and ordered the an iPhone 6S. Did you? Ooh. You broke down. Well, I didn't really break down. I just bought an iPhone. <laughs> I just bought it. Um, so <clears throat> in the uh, ever-expanding uh, experiment with how horrible it is to try to change phone providers in the United States, I, uh, today uh, my, the new iPhone 5S that I bought for my mom uh, arrived with T-Mobile SIM card, turned it on, worked fine at my sister's office. She takes it out to my mom. No coverage. Oh. <sighs> So now, instead of, like, I, with an, it would be bad enough with a normal purchase where you'd be like, oh, it doesn't really work. Can I get my money back? You take it back. Now I not only have to do that, but I have to cancel a, a service. And I have to, tra but I still want to transfer one number from a family plan, but not the other number. And it's going to be like an hour-long phone call, I'm sure, to with get it all Verizon. sorted out. Hey, Jenny. Yo. Can you get a chance? Can you grab a screenshot of Ellie trying to yank my head off? Oh, my gosh, yes. <laughs> Hold on. Oh. This is how baby. This is how babies... Uh, learn. They learn this way, unfortunately. Oh, and, <sighs> this is how Ellie learned her dad's head didn't come off. Oh. <laughs> Easily. I'm going to make the window smaller. Hold on. Daddy, yeah. I want your headphones. <laughs> Give me your headphones. Oh my gosh, she's so cute. <laughs> I've got some great pictures of Kai from when he was younger, stealing, uh -huh. my, stealing my headphones, trying to talk into my mic. Do you ever do you ever look at them when when he's being a little handful and you kind of just like, oh, okay, that's that's why I love him. Because <clears throat> I do that with her. <laughs> that's why you have to keep those cute pictures around. <laughs> oh, I got a good one. <laughs> I got a good one. Thank you. Kai's been on several podcasts, hasn't he? Yeah. Yes, he has. Kai could take actually... Ellie under his wing and be like, here's what it's like um, growing up on podcasts, um, honey. This is what it's, it's like. A... Yeah, he's actually, uh, so he's four and a half now, and he is starting to um, ask me if we can make movies. Oh, no. cool. Yeah, so he takes take my phone. It's, Mommy, can we make a movie now? Like, so one day he showed me how he could take apart the heater grate on the floor. He unscrewed it. He's like, Mommy, videotape this. Ah, <laughs> born director. The, he gets the screwdriver. He's like, so I'm going to go like this, and I'll take the screw out. And then he's like, look, I did it. <laughs> did you get that on film? Did you get that, Mommy? Ah, got it. I got it. That's such a classic. <laughs> That's so awesome. Yeah. But we're, we're actually, um, my husband and I are talking about doing a video podcast mm. that involves Kai. Oh, wow. That's awesome. We've got plans happening. I was just talking to someone about their kid and what a great podcaster she was. Um, and I, I can't remember who. But yeah, it's like kids, it's such a great way to do it. Yeah. Kai cast. The Kai cast. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> There's a friend. He, um, a friend of mine. He wrote the um, uh, calm the calm the f down. Oh, book, book for parenting. Yeah, and he does um, like a weekly news show talking about the news with his kids. Oh and, wow, cool. Yeah, and he's got. I think the boy. They're two boys, and I don't. They might be a couple of years apart. They might be twins. I don't know. I don't remember. But um, but it's super cute. So he'll bring up the news stories and get their opinions on them. And it's just so hilarious to get these, you know, these like five and six-year-old, seven-year-old opinions on 
you know, world politics. <laughs> Like last week, he asked them what he would do with all the uh, the refugees. Uh huh. And and there and and one of the one of the kids is like, well, we'll just build our house taller and invite them to come over. Uh-huh. <laughs> it was really sweet. I know a kid who's like a super Minecraft expert and is just like waiting to be thirteen, just waiting to be yeah. thirteen, so that he can have a YouTube channel. Yeah. It's super adorable. I let my child, I let, I let my son play Minecraft. He's already into Minecraft. Yeah. He likes watching Dan TDM's videos. Oh, wow. And so now when he plays Minecraft, he has a monologue that is very similar to Dan TDM's. It's really funny. <laughs> and that's just so cool. Like, <clears throat> I remember, you know, the, the only equivalent of my childhood I could think of is going out in the backyard with a football throwing it up in the air and doing my own play-by-play to myself, right? Right. Like, uh, and now you've just got so much more access and, and interesting things to, uh, it's great. Yep. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I don't know. I, 13 years old, he'll probably, yeah, he'll probably have some experience in online stuff before he, his own, YouTube, having his own YouTube channel at 13. He'll be like, YouTube, Yeah, man. right. YouTube's over. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I know. Wow. I'm using Blur Spot. <laughs> I'm using Mind Tube. Yeah. yeah. All the kids use Blur's Mind. <laughs> I don't even know how to say that, Kai. Well, you wouldn't. You're old, Tom. You're mind too to old mind. To understand. I'm just going to start a YouTube channel of my dog. You should. Oh, your dog is adorable. Oh, what kind of dog is that? It's a Pomeranian. Oh, it has a Pomeranian. A little ball of fur. <laughs> Look how cute you are. He's like a little waking up from a nap, and he's just like, why have you done this? Why are you doing this? Because I have a camera, and you're cute. Get up yeah. here. <laughs> <laughs> I've turned him into a minor Instagram superstar under, a, under an assumed name. It's really fun. Yeah, I like it. What's your, what's the Instagram account? I like Instagram. Uh, aw, it's A-W-W underscore POM, P-O-M. Okay, I'm going to follow Because he really you. does, he takes a fine picture. I'm going to follow your dog. All right. <laughs> now, if Instagram would just get multiple accounts easy to switch between, I would be very happy because I occasionally accidentally post pictures of, like, real life in the dog feed. Oopsie. That's a <laughs> If Twitter can do it, Instagram can definitely do it. Yeah, I should be able to. Okay, there's the awe club. I want awe palm. It's like awe <laughs> underscore. Uh, there's an underscore it. in there. Yeah, there he is. There's those teeth. Look at that cute little yawn. Oh, that's good. That's going to be good smile stuff. That's, yeah. that's the, Roger, that's the other technique when you're experiencing child-related anxiety. Look at pictures of cute animals. Mm-hmm. Oh, I usually just put up a carpenter's video so she calms down. <laughs> I'm glad that works. I'm I'm in, I'm amazed it works. <laughs> I mean, it's so before her time. It is, but the carpet it's the carpenters. So mm-hmm. soothing. Timeless. Yeah, it's so soothing. But really, although when people say carpenters, they really just mean Karen Carpenter. Oh. Poor other guy whose name no one remembers. <laughs> the brother. How many W's in awe? A W W. Two W's. Two W's. Underscore palm. <clears throat> there she is. There, internet. My secret is out. Well, you know, I follow uh, Bodega. Yeah. And. Uh, the best pictures dogs of, of Jack. Instagram. Yes. Uh, the best picture, actually, to me, it's a really worthy experiment in the power of Instagram hashtags because they really do genuinely work. Like, the population is still small mm-hmm. enough at, like, what, 300 million that it, 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 you get response from it in a way that you just don't on Twitter. And so it's been, for me, it's been, like, an interesting experiment in starting something from scratch that's not just, my friends like my food pictures, uh, <laughs> but actually trying to have a purpose. And see what happens. So There's I don't know. Lilo the Shih Tzu too is my yep. my uh, 
My f- uh, sister-in-law's dog. There's a really cute dog called Astro the Derp, which is like the best name ever. <laughs> but it's because he has like a derpy tongue, and he's so Aww. cute. He's a Pomeranian, but he's like a little borked. Uh, but he's just adorable. I mean, I'm like all in. In my other Instagram identity, I'm all in on cute dogs. <laughs> it's ridiculous. All right. Well, um, out of the post. I've been out of it for a few minutes, but all right. couldn't stop this. Going in. <laughs> uh, so thank you, everybody, for watching. Thanks, everybody. Bye.